Dear Mother, the trail was wrought with misfortune, but today I write you from the land they call Oregon, where I shan't work another day in my life. William Fromm, 1846. In May of 1845, word of the Oregon Trail was spreading east. A journey that before was only possible on horseback could now accommodate wagons. So it's of little surprise that William Fromm, like thousands of other Americans, was dreaming of riches in the West. The government was advertising adventure and prospect in the West. But were the settlers ready for life on the trail? Absolutely not. These wagons face constant danger, and this list is endless. Prairie madness, uh, bears, cholera, bears with cholera. Brush fires, uh, tumbleweeds that came at you too quickly. Mountain lions who've mated with bobcats. This means they're really fast and really mad because they don't know where they come from. Mudslides. Splinters. The splinters. That's a really important one because Abe Lincoln's kid died from that. So if you made it to Oregon, and that's a big if, you probably have a little money saved, but William, he left without any seed money whatsoever. That was classic William. He wasn't the smartest horse out of the gate, but he could run. He could have waited till he got to Oregon, got a job, made a new start, but he figured, man, why wait? By the time they reached Chimney Rock, William's failed businesses counted over 20. He held oxen washes, he gave fortune readings, and he sold costume mustaches made of his own hair. But one night, William, broke, cold, and out of ideas, went to light a fire, a fire that would ignite a revolution. William was an entrepreneur. Where others would have seen obstacles, he saw opportunities. And he got risk deep in those opportunities. On the vast plains of the Midwest, firewood was in short supply. But big, dried up piles of buffalo dung were not. Yes, he sold poop. He gathered up dried poop in his wagon and he sold that poop around and he got rich off that poop. I obtained a hollowed out bison bladder wherein I diligently stored my earnings. And over time, that bladder has grown quite heavy. Upon his arrival in Oregon, William's chip enterprise had grown into a chip empire. He had a dozen chip peddlers across the trail and profits arriving daily. William had it all, but he lived very modestly for years in a little cabin right here in the Willamette Valley. Right next to us. At some point, he realized he never had to work again. He could grow old peacefully, savor the rest of his days. I read, I sleep, I dream. I've taken adventures into new fashions. I've bred a docile flock of ducks that have proven to be great friends. Some days I venture into the woods, but mostly I just retire. But as years passed, rumors spread. William was often seen in the local shops buying goods, but no one had ever seen him work. One night, a posse gathered and accused William of witchcraft. I mean, can you blame them? If he's not working, and he's seemingly living a life of leisure, he's got to be conjuring that money. As I reflected on what truly led me to this place of financial security, I had an epiphany. Everybody was having epiphanies back then. You know, and more often than not, they resulted in a cult scenario, but William, he just thought he had a good idea and people should know about it. William spent months thinking over the perfect campaign. He came up with an analogy of a tree that grew money. If you plant the seed of savings today, it will blossom into a tree you can live off for the rest of your days. He printed posters and pamphlets. He gave speeches and he talked to senators. At rallies, he even handed out little packets of seeds that said, plant the seed of savings today. But I think the seeds are what confuse people. It seems William used to say, 
Retirement is a seed of savings that grows into a tree of wealth. Now, I think if he'd said, it's like a seed, it is quite possibly the most tragic example of a very, very, very poorly used metaphor in American history. The next spring, when the seeds sprouted sickly lemon trees, a mob filled the streets and took William from his home. The newspaper said they dragged him down to the sheriff, and right there, they voted to banish him from Oregon. Took him less than 15 minutes. Most of that was roll call. They were harsh, yeah. Uh, generally speaking, Oregonians were pretty welcoming people, but what were they supposed to do with the trees? It's pretty hard to grow citrus in Oregon. Dear mother, my tree idea went poorly, so I am moving tomorrow. I don't know where to, but I will write when I arrive. Love, William, 1858. Forgetting for a moment the failure of his campaign, William brought a revolutionary idea, not just to Oregon, but to the West, to the U.S., and, dare I say it, to the world. Retirement. His importance cannot be overstated. I, th I think that it can. <laughs> Does no one else? I find myself thanking William daily for reaching Oregon for for planting the seed of this idea that, oh, bless him, he just couldn't quite deliver. I think William's heart was in the right place. I think the money tree analogy, yeah, maybe like a little misguided, but can we call him the inventor of retirement? Yeah, sure, I think if you want to, you can. William Fromm, Oregon Trail entrepreneur, friend to ducks inventor of retirement. <laughs> <laughs>